Should we say, what is the book doing over? We're going to be jumping in, not midway, but a tenth of the way in. Midway into the good part. <laughs> yeah. What is the overall goal of the book? What is Hegel trying to do? I mean, on the one hand, he's doing something very similar to Kant by trying to ground the possibility of knowledge, let's say. Yes. I would say he assumes right in the intro that the possibility of knowledge does not need arguing for. That right in the introduction of the book, he says that skeptics, by which he's including even folks like Kant, who say that, oh, there's a thing in itself that we can never know, that they're unwarranted in doing that. Well, let's not say it's, a, it's an argument, but he shows how he gives this unfolding of different stages of knowledge. I agree with you. He leads off talking a lot about science and the question of whether or not cognition or understanding can get us knowledge. I think that's part of the concern. Yes. Yeah. One of the important things to point out here, in a way, he's reacting to Kant's critique. There's a lot of the stuff, you can see it as a direct response to many things in Kant and other respondents to Kant, like Fichte. Kant spells out this close relationship between the unity of the self and the unity of experience, and the way we construct the world and organize our experience as objects. And one of the things Kant ends up doing with his critique is he limits our knowledge. He cuts us off from things in themselves in order to preserve objectivity. Kant thinks that if you try and maintain our access to things in themselves, you'll never achieve objectivity for reasons that Hume spells out with regard to causality that we've talked about on this podcast. So Kant cuts us off from things in themselves in order to give us one version of knowledge, this objectivity, where objects are no longer things in themselves. And I think Hegel wants to show that, in fact, we don't need to cut ourselves off in that way. I think Kant also wants to preserve the eternal in the thing in itself. The difference between the knowable and the unknowable in Kant is really grounded in the difference between the temporal and the atemporal. Kant wants there still to be this transcendent world of metaphysics. Hegel is like, that's the problem. We have to get rid of the idea that there's this eternal presence that's hidden from us. If we go radically temporal, we can get rid of the thing in itself. Yeah, getting rid of the thing in itself is another way of saying that we have access after all, or that the fact that substance turns out to be subjectivity isn't going to be a problem. Anyway, Mark and Seth are going to get very angry at me if this turns into a conversation about Kant. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, we got to step in. Can I, this actually is relevant. Hegel does distinguish, and this is more chapter five, the one right after we stopped, but this is relevant to his, this is relevant to his style throughout, right? Because if you read this, I mean, it sounds like what we said so far is, you know, Hegel puts forth a series of theories. First, he puts forward something like the naive theory of knowledge and shows why that's wrong. And then puts forth something like Plato's theory of knowledge, shows why that's wrong. Then Aristotle's, that's wrong, et cetera, et cetera. And he leaves out the names, but that doesn't actually capture the style here because the style here is phenomenological, which sounds mm -hmm. strange because phenomenology is a description of experience, but it's not our experience. If you're a Husserl, you kind of right. start like Descartes, I'm sitting in my chair and now I'm going to introspect on my experience. And I start talking about the things in front of me. And like, there's none of that set up for Hegel. Hegel jumps right in such that you're not even clear. Is he actually talking about a human being experience something? Or is this mm -hmm. some kind of abstraction? Is this like how an animal experiences or just this abstract point of view? Like, let's take a really simple theory of knowledge that's in fact too simple. Nobody actually thinks this way, but let's put ourselves in that position and analyze it. And the reason he can do that is because he's got this distinction that comes up again between... Uh, Really, chapter three, A Force in the Understanding, is where he talks about Kant's points about the understanding that we talked about in the Schopenhauer episode as well, about how you need concepts in order to understand anything. We use the understanding as a faculty to organize the contents of experience, something like that. But then the thing that was Schelling's contribution here, which he gets more explicit about in chapter five, but is also there right at the beginning of the self-consciousness, is, and we talked about something like this in the Schopenhauer episode too. Schopenhauer had this yeah, okay, with the understanding, you can do natural science, you could sort of do the kind of things, you could track regularities, you could do causality. But to understand, remember for Schopenhauer, how everything is in fact will, like there's right. some faculty beyond understanding that can give us, Schopenhauer doesn't want to call it knowledge, but he ends up treating it like knowledge, really, through the rest of his, uh, the world is will and representation. Certainly something he can talk about, and it's some kind of empathy. And that's the Schelling's philosophy of nature here. It was in the air, and Hegel is playing on this, that to think of all natural forces, remember for Schopenhauer, even gravity, is something that you could conceive of as will. 
Well, Hegel doesn't use that word exactly, but certainly as something that you could put yourself in the point of view of and describe how things would be like, which seems like a weird sort of abstraction, like what justifies him in being able to do that? He's got this whole big thing at the beginning, how you can't really specify a method in advance for philosophy. If you do that, you're already lost. But yet he's doing this very weird specific thing of like throwing himself from the point of view of these various things. And again, doing it very abstractly so that like in this master and slave chapter that we're going to talk about, you know, most people interpret that as two self-consciousnesses encountering each other. But there are other interpreters that think this is all going on in one person's mind. Well, it is both. Part of the point. Yeah, exactly. One yeah. self-consciousness is necessarily two self-consciousnesses. Yes, absolutely. How do we want to do this? Do you want to start at 166 and start? Because I think Seth is right. This might be one where we should really work through. So I didn't, I mean, I read through the consciousness section, and I think if we could just give like the two-minute elevator pitch that gets you from sensation through perception to understanding, it would help. So this is the down-home cooking version of Hegel. I love the maneuver that he does. He says, okay, well, if we're going to look for knowledge, where could it be? And one place you could say that it is, is sense certainty, that our sensation, like visual, auditory, tactile of the world, at least the fact of the sensation can't be denied. And you could say there's a certain immediacy to the sensation. But he says the immediacy isn't really the truth. It's not really the object, if you will, or the being. He used the term being and truth interchangeably, and I'd like some help with that at some point. But the immediacy of the experience, which is purported to give you a sound basis for knowledge, isn't really what you think it is. Because he says, suppose you say, now is night. In 12 hours, that will not be true. And you're really saying it from your perspective. And so what he does is kind of flip it around and say, anything you ascribe to sense certainty or sensation is really reflected back in you. And it's really about you Yeah, the critical thing there is that insofar as it's related to you, it means it's really a universal. So you really haven't gotten at a particular by, say, ostension and and saying here. You know, you might think there's some radical particularity there, but that here turns out to be a universal, which is illustrated by the fact that it doesn't really name anything except in the, you know, your relation to using it, but then I could use it and my here would be different than your here's. So the attempt at getting at a particular breaks down and Mm -hmm. you end up with something universal, which in this pattern is going to be repeated as we go forward. And the breaking down is really key because there's you get negativity. And the negative is a really key concept for understanding Hegel, and it's a really strange concept. You know, when he's describing that now, how the now develops in sense certainty, he talks about how, you know, we apply now to this moment, and then the word has a meaning for us. When the reference changes, when it's daytime, and now is day, the meaning that it had for us is negated. And we have to expand the meeting to encompass this difference. The night limits the day. We understand them through contrast, but we learn that we can expand the meaning of the term now to encompass differences. So universality is a negative in Hegel. It it is nothing but the differences. It's a weird way of putting it, but that's key. One way of looking at that is that when something requires reference to something else, it's limited by that. And so... Once you get the possibility of the limitation of, say, here by context and you have that negation, that's sort of the same process as making it into a universal. The particular, in a way, is negated in the universal insofar as you bring into the picture lots of different particulars. And it's that assertion that you were making about the particular turns out to, in fact, involve a lot of other different particulars. And that's the limiting factor. And that's the negating factor that's associated with universality. Yeah. If anybody wants to, I've got, I think it was section 90 or I don't know how the pagination works, but... um, Just two sections. Well, in that section on sense certainty, it's page 58 of the version I have, and then it's like 90 from the original yeah. section 90. I think those are the paragraphs in Miller. He says, when you say now is night, and then 12 hours later, now is preserved, but it's not preserved as night. That's the negation. And he says, what you find out is that it's um, mediated both by what it is and what it is not. Mm. And that's what it means to be a universal. And that's how that negation is critical to universality, but also ultimately is going to be critical to... You're right, Tom. It's He really uses this as a central 
I don't know if it's the right way to call it methodological or systemic a structural piece of what he's doing, but the idea that negation is part of what we do and that you negate and leave behind, you negate as part of your positive yes. process. He says over and over again throughout the text that cognition pays no attention to its act of differentiating. So it takes everything as a positive entity and it doesn't recognize the differentiation and difference as the active component of the concept of conceiving anything. We need some examples here. This is going to be nothing to people. So like Bertrand Russell, let's just say a particular for him is like red patch here now. <laughs> You know, so whatever that is, <laughs> I'm not even going to say, I'm not even going to conceptualize about it. I could be wrong about what this, you know, I think it's a book, but let's leave aside its bookness. I could be wrong about that, but I am certain right now that I'm having a sensation of red. And the fact that later I'm going to have a sensation of something else, how is that even relevant to the fact that I am absolutely certain that right now I'm having a sensation of red and therefore I've founded knowledge? Seth, you know, you said before about the difference between being and truth in Hegel. He says that in the experience of sense, the truth vanishes. And I think what he means there is that the truth is the concept of what it is. So that the concept of the book, the concept of its redness are completely necessary to having that experience of the book. So if Russell were to simply say, no, it's just this book and it's just this redness, he's just wrong. He's missing the fact that the concept, it's mediated by language. You can't make sense of a book or redness without language. So think of Kant's saying that concepts and particulars are mutually dependent or perception is theory-laden. You don't get particulars without universals. You can't access them except through concepts. They're empty. What is it? What's Kant's thing? Intuitions without concepts are blind. Yeah. That's yeah. very fitting, because that's almost what Hegel means when he talks about the truth is, disappearing. Yeah. So, yeah, Mark, my response to what you were saying about Russell saying that particulars, red patch here now, that Hegel says in this section that what sensation gives you or what sense certainty is, is immediacy. But it's an immediacy that he says does not have the truth of being. It has the truth of has been. And so in addition to the fact that the immediacy of sensation doesn't give you a particular, it just gives you the immediacy of this broad swath. You may talk about it and say, oh, now is night. I am here now. And you think you're talking about a particular that points something out. But in reality, you're just making reference to universals. He also seems to think that sensation is always talking about something that's past, which is to say you're talking about something that is not, and that knowledge is not about what is not, it's about what is. There's also the social dimension here. These are the values. Not in this chapter. <laughs> no, I think it is present. It's just that it doesn't become apparent until later and you look back, because there's no way that the universal makes sense if it isn't part of language, and language already implies a social dimension. I don't know. What do you guys think about this as a criticism, though, of a theory that says that our sense data are going to be the source of our enduring eternal knowledge? I think the points he made were pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it seems, again, the idea that, say, perception is theory-laden, or if you analyze the concept of radical particularity that fools itself into thinking it's escaped universality, you'll find that the universal is already there. The concept is already there, or whatever, however you want to put it. I think that's the point he's making, and I think it's... I think that's good enough for one-third of our two-minute summary. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> section. Yeah. I agree. And the second part is, once you've admitted that universals are involved in you seeing things, well, there's still the problem of the relation of properties to their underlying substance, something like that. That's mm -hmm. what the second one is about. So we went from sense certainty to perception. And basically, perception is the layer at which you start to make distinctions in your sensation and identify things, things with properties, as opposed right. to just straight up sense certainty. And he's going to say the concept of a thing is ultimately incoherent, because just like back to Descartes, wax yep. example, exactly. where, oh, look, the wax, it can melt away, it can change all these properties, but yet it's still the wax, therefore... What the wax really is, is the underlying substance that has all these properties. But then, well, what is that? That's a completely empty concept. So we sort of go back and forth between thinking of this mysterious, unknowable substance that underlies all these properties and oh, a cluster of properties, which that just doesn't even make sense because there has to be something that holds them together as the thing. And so both of these are unsatisfactory 
So we have to get pushed to the next level. Yep. I felt like this was a little more nuanced than that. I thought what he was saying was, look, if you get to the level of perception and you identify a thing with properties, the thing in itself or the thing being for itself, you think of it as differentiated from everything else, except that as soon as you use the word differentiation, you have to compare it to something else. You have this thing, it has properties, but you can abstract out the properties and then you can say, oh, well, it has this property, but not this property. And these properties are contradictory. And this thing has these other properties and it's not this thing. And so this idea that there's a thing that exists in itself that you're somehow discerning with perception, it breaks down because you have to negate that standaloneness. This is where he says, you know, you have to um, acknowledge the also it also is the relationship to other things into this whole unified group. Or is it the relation of the properties within the thing? The fact that the wax has a color and the wax has a texture. The example he uses is salt. He says, you can say, oh, here's a container of salt. And we might say, oh, that's the thing. The thing is this container of salt and it has the property of whiteness and it has the property of being tart, being salty, I guess. I don't know. And he says, but actually the saltiness and the whiteness and all that are in me and they can be in other things as well. But we use other properties to distinguish that from the pepper shaker, for example. Just the idea that you would pick out an individual thing with the faculty of perception and call it a thing in itself and standalone doesn't make sense for two reasons. One is it's always in relation to other things. And the other thing is it is always a thing for you or for consciousness. He uses the term consciousness. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing as a thing in itself. There's a thing in itself for consciousness. But we also wouldn't want to infer then that that means that the things are just pure ideas. This is total idealism in the sense that the reality just has this subjective character. No, 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 no. What he's saying is at the level of perception, if you're talking about a thing, you're not talking about the thing in itself. You're talking about the thing as it is in your perception. Right. That's the phenomenology. Yep. Yes, because your perception, you're already contributing the universal and the concepts and all that stuff to it to make it into a thing. He mentions very early on that we think of cognition as either an instrument that shapes things for knowledge or a medium through which they get distorted. And if we could just figure out how the instrument affects it or figure out how the medium distorts it, we'd be able to get at the things themselves. And this is kind of the key move for me where he's saying perception, and ultimately we're going to find out that understanding as well, is not a medium or an instrument. It's not like you can remove the filter or correct for the changes that the instrument of perception makes. It's that everything is always for perception, for consciousness. In a weird way, I think all these moments, sense certainty, perception, the phenomenology both shows their failure, but it also validates them. The idea of the phenomenology is that you're showing how it is that cognition comes to these concepts. The invalidation or the failure is also in desire, and that this is what will lead up to self-consciousness. Which, so you just pushed us to the third part, force right. and the understanding. Just for listeners out there, this one is brutal. This is, <laughs> <laughs> But we are going to be similarly brief with it. Yes, I agree, but it was still, an, it's extremely tough reading. Someone give it one line. Uh... <laughs> the key thing here is, and we can maybe shoot ahead a little bit and anticipate the self-consciousness chapter. The concept of force for Hegel is where the concept of dialectic is really introduced. One of Hegel's arguments in Force and Understanding is that we can't conceive force without a relation. Force inherently means expression. So a force has to be expressed. And to be expressed, it has to be expressed into something that limits it. So force forces us to have a concept of multiple forces. You have to have something exerting force and something resisting in order for that force to meet, like a presence. And so there you have this kind of dialectical character of the concept of force. I think we need to give an example with every single one of these, or it's just not. <laughs> so for instance, it's this thinking about gravity. Like really all we know gravity is because things are falling. So you could say, look at all those things falling. That is gravity. The thing falling is gravity. Or you could imagine that there's something behind it pushing the thing. There's that invisible right. force that's causing it. So are those the two moments of the force is the actual phenomena experienced and then this thing we posit as being behind it. I wasn't really sure what the duality... That doesn't translate into, oh, there have to be two forces there. If a force is an activity, there has to be a reactive resistance to it. 
there really is a right a strong parallel to Kant here, and with Part C and the understanding and the concept of force, right? I mean, it's reminiscent, for instance, of Hume's critique of causality. In a way, I think it's a restatement of that. So the idea is that you know we don't take in something like causality through our senses, and when something like that is an object for us. There's a sense in which we're making ourselves an object. It's the form of our experience. In a way, our access to that is really an access to ourselves. It sort of leads into the next stage of self-consciousness. Experience is being constructed by the understanding. And in accessing those, we're not accessing something which is itself a phenomena. We're ac right. accessing something which is formal. And that formal element has been added by the subject. So insofar as we're accessing that formal element, we're accessing subjectivity. So we're on our way to self mm, on yeah. our way to self consciousness. Yeah, he talks about the super sensible, that this is where we first get an explicit idea of something that is a not directly empirical object of sense. To conceive of a force means that we have to begin thinking beyond the immediate objects of sense. Yeah. We talked about something similar to this. I don't remember which episode it was, where we were talking about this idea of an inner life and whether you could actually stop thinking. Like, you can't prevent yourself from having idea after idea. You know, you can't stop your mind from doing what it does. Hegel says at one point in this section, he talks about the simple inner world. He's got a nice sort of summary at the beginning of the section four, where he says, In the previous modes of certainty, what is true for consciousness is something other than itself. But the notion of this truth vanishes in the experience of it. What the object immediately was in itself, mere being in sense certainty, the concrete thing of perception, and for the understanding of force, proves to be in truth not this at all. Instead, this in itself turns out to be a mode in which the object is only for another. If we think about these three stages that we're about to leave behind, in each one we identify something that's supposed to be the object of knowledge that turns out to be really for something else. So in sense certainty, it's being, which turns out to be for consciousness via universals. Perception, it's the thing in itself, which turns out to be for consciousness via universals. And then understanding is a bit more complicated because you have sort of this inner world or this force that still ultimately has to refer to some sort of perception or refer to something outside of itself to have any kind of content, to kind of try to use non-Hegelian language to close out this section to Marx's satisfaction. What he's saying is, if you go looking in these three places for objects of knowledge that you can rely on in some way, shape, or form, sense, perception, or understanding, you end up having to refer to something else in order for them to have any meaning or to make sense to have content. And so they're not suitable objects for knowledge. Sure. Let me put one more thing out from uh, Solomon about the movement from this forcing the understanding part to the part that we're actually going to focus on, which is self-consciousness. So we're talking about in chapter three there, forcing the understanding about science, All right? We've got forces, we've got causality more generally. I don't know if uh, Hegel actually says something like this in the text. I didn't look closely enough, but... Solomon brought up that image that we talked about in our Wittgenstein Tractatus episode. You know, you've got all these phenomena that science records, and then you have a theoretical structure on top of it. You could even think of it as exactly. like you've got a bunch of dots, and you could draw different shapes on top of it, and the shapes could still give you a good picture of the dots. It's just, you know, a number of different shapes would do it. So that ultimately, science is not going to definitively tell you for any given set of phenomena what theoretical structure to have over that. So you have to choose between them. You have to turn to some sort of pragmatic consideration. You have to turn, why are we doing the science in the first place? What kind of explanation do we want out of it? So for instance, to our philosophy of mind episode, I'm looking at human behavior. I could try to just explain it in terms of behavioral inputs and outputs. I could try to explain it on a neural level. I could try to explain it just in terms of your conscious experience, you know, something phenomenologically. And our choice between those is not only going to be sort of how accurately does it match the variety of data and does it let us predict certain things. Well, actually, prediction is very much on par here because mm -hmm. that plays into, well, why are we doing this theorization in the first place? If I'm trying to determine, for instance, I'm trying to con construct a workplace that is going to you know, make my workers have maximum output, then maybe a behaviorist model will work pretty well. I don't have to pay attention to what they say about whether they like it or not. I just have to pay attention to if I turn the lights up, do they work better? If I turn the temperature down, do they work better? A behaviorist model works just fine for that. 
there's a turn in all epistemological practice to the pragmatic. One important thing here, Mark, I think, just to give a overview of these three parts that we've talked about, you know, we started out with sense certainty and increasingly the contributions of the subject become increasingly important, right? So the idea is that we have yet another contribution from the subject with which we're headed towards self-consciousness. It's sort of a mirror for the subject. I mean, ultimately, the contribution of the subject will become work where we're actually crafting the world to reflect us. Seth, you know German? Yeah. What is craft? Craft is strength. Okay. Craft work is a... Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's what that section is called. Craft und Verstand. Mm. Force and understanding. Etymologically, it sounds like you know, we're moving into this idea that we understand force because of our own agency, our own craft. All right. Self-consciousness. Okay. Just summarizing 166. So he says, in what's come before, we've seen that there's successive attempts at getting at some sense of a independent thing in itself for knowledge kept turning into a, quote, mode in which the object is only for another. So again, the contributions of the subject kept getting more, you know, with every step, the for another part kept coming back in. We gave up. This is where I think he's reiterating the Kantian theme of giving up certainty for truth, which means, I think, giving up things in themselves for objectivity. Consciousness takes itself as an object, but now we get to the point where consciousness will take itself as an object, which means that certainty and objectivity become the same thing. The being in itself and the being for another are the same. Because I take my I by taking myself as an object, it's something which has this immediacy for me. Right. We should point out for listeners, so you're probably used to hearing the word objectivity as meaning that sort of mind independent. Oh, that's objective. But yeah, good point. for a phenomenologist, right, if the mind is focused on something, then it is the mind's object and therefore it is objective. And so to say objectivity means, yeah, we've given up things in themselves for objectivity means we've restricted ourselves to the realm of phenomena and objectivity is made possible because we, our mind constructs phenomena and then when we come back to it to make judgments, we can make the concepts accord properly with what we're judging. So the phenomena are these subject-laden objects, and that's how we get objectivity. But we've given up a sort of naive notion of access to things in themselves in order to ground that objectivity. So now we get to the important part of this is this idea that when we take ourselves as an object, we're now in this special position. You could say also that this is sort of the Cartesian moment, and this is like Descartes saying that Aha, the mm -hmm. cogito is the basis of all knowledge because it's so certain. But what Hegel wants to say is, okay, great, but this is just an abstraction because we haven't yet understood how that's possible or why we've arrived at that point. We're just saying, yes, Descartes, he's got it. He's like, yes, you know, the I is this yeah. uncertainty. But in Hegel's language, every phase of consciousness passes through at least three stages an early stage, which he calls the immediate. There's a middle stage where we find there are problems. We find we don't fully understand this immediate idea that we had. And it comes into discord with the rest of our experience because it's still not adequate to describe or to comprehend the rest of our experience. And then like a late stage where it just falls apart and then a new idea kind of emerges. Right now, we're just at this immediate grasp of self. And so in 167, we get a problem. It seems like a good time, to, just the way you were describing that, Tom. So remember, Schopenhauer's big beef with this was that Hegel and a lot of other philosophers, he think, did not properly distinguish between the relationships between ideas and relationships between physical things. That, according to Schopenhauer, the principle of sufficient reason needs to be clearly differentiated in different realms so that we don't confuse say, the laws of causality with the way logical deductions work, that we really need to keep those to their proper realms. And Hegel is entirely, I mean, you were just describing it, Tom, in terms of ideas, which sounds like the earlier chapters that we're talking about. We got this idea of this theory of sense certainty, and we examine it, and it ends up falling apart by the end of the section. But in this section, we're going to be actually talking about beings themselves. We're going to be actually talking about organisms who are looking at themselves and maybe the organism itself is changing. So we're saying, mm -hmm. just like ideas have these changes, 
the objects themselves have this change. And I can put that sort of to the highest level of abstraction. We've talked a few times about Heraclitus versus Parmenides, the idea of Parmenides. Oh, everything is static. Ultimately, underneath all this apparent change, there's just a static oneness or something like that. And Heraclitus, oh, no, 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 everything is ultimately flux. So Hegel's contribution is, as you probably guessed, he's a version of Heraclitus of everything is change, but it's a very specific pattern of change. 